you're wrong. Okay. Go ahead, Tony. Okay, I'll start it in just a second. We got folks logging on right now. I'll give it about a 10 second countdown here. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Cox. I'm a facilities operations engineer who spent the last 16 years creating and maintaining learning environments for our students. And I'll be your facilitator for this morning's eye-opening topic. My colleague, Mr. Jim Detterman, will be your head researcher and presenter. Our presentation today is a journey of discovery a fresh and living look into learning spaces that you never expected yet maybe somehow have always known is there. I think it's the ultimate combination between student learning and the ecosystem which supports us all. The more I have come to understand biophilic design, the clearer I see it as a natural vision for student success. Folks, this isn't just another Zoom topic. It is a game changer, so do yourself a favor. Text your colleagues that are registered for this event and tell them to log on now and hear this. As your facilitator today, I'm a seeker. So let's start by seeking our, national, our natural vision by answering the question, why? Why are we interested in this when there are so many other educational philosophies, practices, and techniques out there? Let's look at it from our leadership's perspective. All across the country, from most every survey done, these five top concerns consistently emerge for school districts. Why? Well, because parents want their children kept safe and secure while in our daily care. Teachers have choices now on the places they wanna teach in. Students have to feel nurtured, sustained, and engaged in order to learn and achieve. And the entire district has to be sustained as a positive culture in and of itself for taxpayer effectiveness. Notice some of the words in my points. They sound almost biological, right? Because from our perspective, it's all about the learning environment. Just a quick definition here. And actually it turns out there's two definitions in Webster's. The first one is where life, including ourselves, operate. And the second is the fact that it's definitely affected by human activity. So to us, a learning environment begins with environment, like an ecosystem. Let's dig just a little bit deeper on this subject. Here we see the most accepted definition of a learning environment. It begins with the physical aspects, which we design and create so well, but it also encompasses the culture and the class in the school. That same culture that's always a top five concern. This interaction recalls that ecosystem, which must be sustained that we just talked about. So what does this mean today for us as planners, designers, constructors, and maintainers of a built environment? We have a functional vision now of a modern learning environment. As you can see here, besides being constantly focused on the student, the modern learning environment needs to create spaces that are free, free from stress and need, a nurturing space free from illness and injury, a healthy space, from distraction, an engaging space, from hazards and fear, a safe space, from threats and harm, a secure space, and from limitation and restrictions, a flexible space. Now, if you look at this, the bottom three of those characteristics have been really prime topics in our building programs for the last 10 years. But now the top three, particularly with COVID-19 in, in our world now, are taking center stage. I personally have come to realize that freedom from negative impacts to learning is the natural product of a sustainable learning environment. As my former district, at my former district, our leaders and community stakeholders realize this too. And we adopted sustainability as one of the prime strategies for creating the modern learning environment as part of our master plan. In fact, we concluded that a modern learning environment is a safe and secure learning environment. 
And one of those is a sustainable learning environment. That's our natural vision for our future. We also realize that whether the student is at the center of the previous slide or the teachers are in the center or our schools or even our community, those six characteristics were the same. And keeping our natural vision for biologic design is a great way to get us there. And now there's research to prove it. That's what Mr. Jim Detterman will lead you through in a few moments. This morning, we'd also like to keep things practical and learn how we can grow this new philosophy for our schools. So as you're listening, we'd like your help to research the research. Will this philosophy help us create a learning environment where students feel safe and healthy and learn better? What's the best way to move forward with adopting this philosophy as a district, as a service providing industry? We need your feedback today. Please take our three question survey at the website listed on your screen. We'll put the, we have put this URL in the chat bar already, but you can also point your phone at the QR code that you're seeing and get to our survey site and we'll have another QR code at the end of the presentation. It's only a five minute survey folks and your insights are invaluable to us as we move forward. I would like to go ahead now and introduce Mr. Jim Detterman for the rest of the presentation. For 30 years, he has been um, designing learning spaces. His work has received numerous design awards, most recently for Green Street Academy, which is the location of the study today. He leads multidisciplinary teams of architects, educators, and scientists in research to prove ev provide evidence of a link between design and learning. And he's been presenting at audiences all across the country. Jim? Thank you, Tony. First, I wanna say, <clears throat> that I want you all to know that I believe that design matters. And I cannot think of any building type where design matters more than in learning space. Because a well-designed learning space can literally have the ripple effect of changing the lives of generations of young people. But when I would say design matters to my clients, they would say, well, what do you mean? How does it matter? How much does it matter? So we started using research uh, to show them, look, research shows you design the learning space with a lot of daylight, test scores are going to go up. Research has proved it. And then we started getting into our own research that was more specific about our own projects. So this is our latest uh, study. Uh, the, the organizations at the bottom are the uh, organizations that teamed with us uh, to do it. And uh, so Terrapin Bright Green, who you may know is a national uh, sustainability and biophilic design consultant. Uh, the Salk Institute, uh, there were two neuroscientists that were key uh, to uh, providing the basis for our study. And then we worked with um, educators and scientists at Morgan State University. Uh, the, the study was done in Baltimore, Maryland, and this is our local uh, School of Architecture. So um, this is a published study. Uh, it was funded by the American Institute of Architects. And all of the organizations and, and firms that you see on the screen right now provided funding uh, or uh, sweat equity uh, or knowledge uh, to in order to, for the, uh, the study to happen. So this is a very robust scientific uh, uh, study uh, with real quantitative and qualitative uh, assessment techniques. And we'll talk about all that. This is the team. Uh, that's me, uh, Jim Detterman. I was the principal investigator on the project. I'm an architect at Craig Alden Davis. Uh, Tom Albright uh, is a, a professor and he leads a lab of the, the visual brain at the uh, Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. Bill Browning is a managing and founding partner of Terrapin Bright Green. And really the theories of the biophilic design really came from both Dr. Albright and from Bill. Uh, Dr. Akers, Marianne Akers is the uh, Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at Morgan State University. Uh, Dr. Paul Ar uh, Archibald uh, is a, a professor of uh, uh, social work and led the stress portion of our study. Dr. Catherine Martin Dunlop uh, is the uh, director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Morgan State University. Uh, she led the learning aspect of our study. And Valerie Carullo is an architect with Hort Copa Mach who worked with me throughout the study. So first, we want to talk about the neuroscience basis for at least a portion of our study. 
Then we're going to talk about biophilic design. What is it? Where does our study fit within the other studies within the world of biophilic design? And then we'll talk about the study itself, the methodology, the findings, and then we'll wrap. So first of all, normally there's a neuroscientist, <laughs> Dr. Albright, that, that speaks about this topic. I'm not a neuroscientist. I've been an architect for 35 years. So I'm going to give you the architect's understanding of the neuroscience basis for the study. And he would always begin by saying, can neuroscience tell us anything useful about architecture and design? Well, think about the brain as an information processing device, right? It acquires information through the senses, it organizes labels, assigns, stores, and we use that information to guide our actions. So the visual environment has measurable statistics. Neurons are organized in such a way to facilitate the processing of statistical regularities in the visual world. What do I mean by that? Let me, let me illustrate with this little diagram right here. So this image uh, of, of randomly oriented objects arrayed throughout this field, right? Our eye detects a certain pattern, a certain strength. Let me help you. See that right there? We see that instead of just in this random array, our eye sees that. Oops, let me go back. So why, why do we, I'm sorry, I'm going back too far. Why do we see that? If I just have a randomness, if I take that kind of pattern away, we don't, we don't see anything. So why does our eye see that red line pattern? Well, it's not a coincidence that the natural world is replete with contours like that curved line. Repeating lines in a collinear, curvilinear, parallel, or a radial pattern are ubiquitous in the natural world. When we see these contours in nature, that data, that visual data, is easily facilitated by our brain, the information processor. This ease of facilitation translates to us, for example, as we find something beautiful, or it relaxes us, or it's stress relieving, or it regenerates us, and it, it actually raises our attention level. Now, architects have at least subconsciously known this for a long time. Look at the repeating curvilinear lines in Thorn Crown Chapel by Faye Jones in the Ozark Mountains, right? And the beauty of the radial pattern in the rose window at the Cathedral of Notre Dame, Paris. Table stay bridges have, have, are universally found to be beautiful. Why is that? The regularity of patterns in space and time facilitate an understanding of the environment and it fosters an ease of processing. And this, this ease of processing is, is the basis of biophilic design. So we, uh, neuroscientists speculate these organizational properties in the neuronal system evolve uh, because it facilitates our detection of features of nature that our early ancestors relied on for survival. And our ancestors passed on this detection ability to us. Now we find these patterns beautiful, satisfying, attractive. They make us feel relaxed. They make us feel happy. Now there's a much more in-depth description of this in Tom Albright's chapter in a book called Mind in Architecture. It's edited by Juhani Palazma, uh, which is a name you may be familiar with. But in this book, Mind in Architecture, Tom Albright wrote a chapter of neuroscience and architecture and he dives deeper into this whole discussion. So if you're interested, I recommend that you uh, uh, buy the book. Now, let's talk about biophilia, bio biophilia and biophilic design. Well, biophilia is the theory that human beings are innately connected to nature and living things, right? There's been like 40 or 50 years of good research and discussion about biophilic design, but really it became quite popular in, the, in a, when, when a, a book called The Biophilia Hypothesis written by E.O. Wilson it happened in the 80s. So biophilic design has been around again for decades. And mostly it's been tested in healthcare, workplace, and those kinds of facilities where there are dollars that pay for something that proves a business model, 
right? So for example, in this study, the Ehrlich study in 1984, uh, hospital patients were presented with the view out their window of a brick wall or green and vegetation, nature, a view to nature. And what they found was that those patients that had that view to nature had shorter hospital stays. And uh, they actually uh, got well faster, about a day faster than the typical patient that uh, just had a brick wall uh, out their window. And here's an example of the kind of uh, result from that study. Uh, this is a project by uh, HOK, CPG Architects in Singapore. But you can see outside of every hospital window, there's going to be a view to nature. Fractals. Um, fractals are a pattern that repeats itself in a smaller dimension. So for example, a snowflake is a fractal. A tree is a fractal. Fire is actually a statistical fractal. When we look at fractals, for whatever reasons that go beyond me, it encourages our perceptual brain rather than our cognitive brain, right? We have a preference for looking at fractals. They actually have been proven to be uh, restorative and also make us feel more relaxed. A view to nature uh, was studied uh, uh, by Lee Williams in a 200 to 2015 study. And in this study, uh, people in a workplace were presented with a view of just a, a, a rooftop with uh, just a gray uh, asphalt rooftop. And then they were also presented with a rooftop with yellow flowers. And what the study showed is that this actually improved the attention and the production of the people in the workplace when they had the view to the yellow flower. So again, in 2015, uh, there really hasn't been a lot of research uh, involving learning space, but in 2015, there was a study done in Barcelona with thousands of school children and literally um, dozens or even hundreds of schools. And they looked at children that, that walked to school in an urban environment without a green canopy and went to a school that had no green canopy versus students that walked to school in a vegetated environment and had a green canopy at the school. And they actually found that just the green canopy itself was, was a benefit to improve cognition for those students. And this is really over thousands of students, so a great big sample size in Bar Barcelona, 2015. So then there's the, uh, the book that was written by um, Terp and Bright Green called The 14 Patterns of Biophilic Design. And this really was a convening of 40, 50 years of research on biophilic design. And they identified in a, in a really, really easy to read, really very easy to use guide, 14 patterns, different things that can be done that have been proven to produce different wellness or um, cognition improving uh, responses by human beings. Here's a, here's a, a page from that book that actually uh, shows you the 14 patterns on the left-hand side and then across the top, there were studies that have been that have proved that for each one of these patterns, they've they've reduced stress or they've improved cognition or they just improved their, your mood or, or attitude. And as you can see, there's some empty boxes there. And, and our study was designed to help fill some of those empty boxes. So let's talk about our study. I'm just going to give this a slide for a minute because I just love to look at this slide. <laughs> it's called me. Okay, words. So we've got to be very specific about our study now. Um, our study proposed to test and understand the contribution of a biophilic learning space to do two things, reduce student stress and enhance learning outcomes. I've always been very interested in doing research that uh, showed that we can design the learning space that's going to uh, help achieve student uh, academic success. But in this case also, uh, the biophilic design is also gonna show that we were able to reduce student stress quite significantly. So 
Our study is just like any other study. We take one classroom and we enrich it with biophilic enhancements. And we have a control class where we don't do any changes to the classroom, but we study the, the effects, the different effects of the students and how they react differently. And then we mark how differently they react in the, in the two uh, classrooms. So I'll go, that, I'll go more in depth in that uh, when we talk about the study in a minute. But how did we enrich that biophilic in the classroom? First, we did visual connection with nature. And at the top, you can see the 14 patterns uh, uh, history of how visual connection with nature has made students feel or have made people react. Uh, lowered blood pressure and heart rate. It's actually improved mental engagement and attentiveness and had positive impact on attitude. We also chose dynamic and diffused light uh, because it's been shown to reduce stress. Now, we also uh, note that in the uh, other two boxes, there hasn't been any research, so hopefully we can contribute to this one. And then biomorphic forms and patterns. This is the Salk Institute's uh, interest, right? The, the patterns that align with the organization of the neurons in our brain, that when we see this pattern, this radial pattern inside a sunflower seed, where you see the collinear lines, not quite parallel, but they're collinear, right? They sort of are in perspective of this, uh, the corn rows there. Um, these are triggers for de-stressing. So um, we'll see how some of, some of this works in our study. So there's, a, there's the three, uh, visual connection, dynamic diffuse light, biomorphic forms and patterns. We also get a bonus, non-rhythmic sensory stimuli. So for those of you that design schools, as I do, um, there's usually one wall that is the window wall, right? And if I'm looking at the, the instructor or if I'm uh, dealing with a student group, I'm typically not, not looking at the window wall. But if I see movement outside that's non, it's unusual, it's non-rhythmic, right? I may turn and look. And when I do that, that does a couple of things. One is, and the cone, the, the cone of focus goes from like five meters from student to teacher to more than 30 meters. So your, your cone of focus zooms out. Your, the muscles in your eyes zoom out, right? And the other thing it does is that when I'm looking at nature, again, remember I'm using my perceptual brain and I'm giving my cognitive brain kind of a break. So if I'm looking at that, that non-rhythmic sensory stimuli for 30 seconds and then come back, I've actually restored my attention. And this has been proven. It's called the Attention Restoration Theory, ART, proven by the Kaplan's. So remember, we used to take windows out in school design, right? <laughs> we had no windows, we had no walls inside, absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, we want students to not be putting their head down on the table, not, not suffer from attention fatigue from someone who's just standing up and prattling on, but take a break. Look outside, use that perceptive brain, and then come back, right? So we've got these four patterns that we're able to use in our study. The subject of our study is Green Street Academy. This is a charter school. Uh, it was a renovation that was done in a 1925 building in uh, the west side of Baltimore, Maryland. So this is a public, Baltimore City public charter school. It is a middle uh, to high school. So it's grade six through 12. And our study was with a sixth grade math class. There it is uh, from above Green Street Academy, the experiment site. Um, this is before the renovation. Uh, but unfortunately, this school was built in 1925. And as school designers now know, the proper solar orientation for uh, windows needs to be north south. And unfortunately, they didn't know that in 1925. So all the windows are facing east west which um, helps play into our, our study. Here are some images of the uh, biophilic classroom before it was enriched with biophilic enhancements, right? So we had renovated this to be a 21st century school. So you see a lot of steel case, no chairs and uh, whiteboards all the way around. Good, good learning environment, but uh, uh, a little harsh, a little hard. As you can notice, some of the blinds are down and totally closed. Now here's the control classroom. We didn't change anything in the control classroom except one thing. We put carpet over the floor because we put carpet in the biophilic classroom and we didn't want a difference in acoustics. But we put carpet in the biophilic classroom for the pattern. We just put a plain gray carpet in the control classroom 
But look at what you see. All the blinds are down and closed. This is not atypical for a learning space. And then look at the walls of whiteboard that were meant for students uh, to publicly engage with their own learning. It's covered with learning environments. And um, this is uh, something that the neuroscientist said is, is really more damaging than helpful to students. There's no relief for the eye at all. Here's a rendering of the biophilic classroom. Look at the view to nature. We planted a garden outside the window. It does not have to be an elaborate uh, garden. We had a very generous benefactor, a landscape contractor that provided a, a much more than what we needed. So we're grateful to that. Uh, but just a garden outside that maybe has uh, flowering plants in the spring that can provide uh, allure habitat to get that non-sensory stimuli. Um, and then we put a dynamic and diffuse lighting. We replaced the opaque mini blinds with mecho shades that are a weaved fabric so that always there's a soft light coming through. We also put a print of a tree shadow on the fabric of the, the shade. Uh, so even when they're closed, you're getting that fractal effect, that understanding that there's nature right outside that window. And we also put, we, we made these shades motorized. We put it on a solar cell. So it takes the teacher out of the, out of the picture. She's busy trying to teach. She's not worried about putting blinds up and down. Um, so when the sun goes away around the corner, the shades go up a little bit. Eventually they go, they go all the way up and students get full view to nature and they get all that daylight that we know uh, improves test scores. And then we replaced the floor with carpeting that uh, this was an interface product uh, that uh, was prairie grass, right? So it had that natural pattern. We also, the neuroscientist and an artist at Design Techs, uh, affiliated with Steelcase, um, came up with a pattern uh, to put on the wall covering above the whiteboard. So that's a biophilic pattern, just a very, it wasn't about color, it was really about the pattern. And we also found a biophilic uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, ceiling tile uh, from a company called Turf. And this was actually called Swell. It looks like a little wave carved into the bottom of these pieces of felt that come down vertically. So that's our biophilic classroom. Here's some images, the shades, nothing on the walls, <laughs> very calming. There's the prairie grass, there's the garden. You don't need anything this extravagant, but an opportunity for students to actually go out and be in the garden, sit in the garden, work in the garden, also a good idea. Now, Good time. So um, assessment, uh, any kind of study is only as good as how it's assessed. So we assessed four different ways. We, we look at stress. So we, we did that by measuring heart rate variability. And I'll explain that in a little bit in a couple of seconds. Uh, we did student surveys. We asked them uh, about their own sense of their own stress and how they felt the learning was in the learning space. Uh, we also did student and instructor interviews, and you're going to hear some of those today. Uh, we also took a look at learning outcomes. Now, we had a different control for the learning outcome, uh, but um, I'll explain that when we get there. But very, very good assessment on this uh, study. So let's start off with what the students in the biofuel classroom thought about the space. Um, we interviewed um, five students, and we've got snippets of interviews from three students that we want to show you now. So it's better that you just hear it right from their own words. So let's hope this technology works. It gives me a more purpose to learn, knowing that I'm like in a good environment. Like I'm sitting like by the light, so it's like better for me to understand or like view what's going on in the classroom and I'm more comfortable in the classroom. Um, well, along with the floors and the lighting and stuff, it just makes it easier for me to focus more and get back into what I'm doing because it kind of draws out the distractions and stuff that might be happening around me so it can make it easier for me to stay focused on what I'm doing. Do these things help you learn math, do you think? It relaxes me. It what? Relaxes. Relaxes you? How does it do that? Because uh, with the light of the, um, the sun makes it concentrate better. 
instead of having the regular events. Most of the time, um, my stress level is very calm and I don't, nothing really to stress about. So in other classrooms, you stay stressed, but in this math classroom, tell me again. It, it goes down and it, I can refocus and calm down from where else the stress will get back to what I'm doing. Do you ever feel stressed in that classroom? For a test, no. No? Good for you. Never. You just take the test and that's, you're done. Yes. Wow. Oh, the blinds, how they go up and down automatically, so it's a really nice light in there. How does that affect your learning? Um, mainly because I have really bad eyes, so it can make it easier for me to see certain things on the board. Uh, what I want to see is, is the windows. Windows? Yeah, there's some light coming in through on Sunday. How does that compare to other classrooms, those windows, when you first go in that classroom? Looks like the, um, my other classes, the blinds are always closed. Oh. But you prefer them open? Yes. That's sunlight. like The ceiling. What about it? The ceiling. It goes away the heads. Mm -hmm. see it. Why do you like that? The color. It hey, what? Um, when the, you turn the air on, and you're under it, cools it down. So I like that the waves in the ceiling calm curvy <laughs> and make them feel cooler. All right, one more video. This is the instructor. Describe what it was like to teach in this class. What, what are your What are your thoughts about this classroom? What do you, What do you think about it? Um, the room is beautiful. Like it, it feels very homey. It feels like. It's a comfortable space to be in. Um, the windows, being able to get that natural light in here um, at different times of the day is really, I really enjoy the windows. Um, outside the scenery, it now that it's spring, it's all nice and everything has bloomed. You can see all the trees and things outside. So it, it's, it's a space you can easily just get caught up staring outside. Um, and I've noticed that students do that too. And then they quickly kind of get themselves back together. Like it, it kind of, it helps with kids that are having a, a difficult time and they just kind of space out for a minute and then they come back. Yeah. We just did our state testing park um, last week. And I noticed earlier this week actually for math and it was a lot of them, they wanted to face the direction of the windows during testing. Usually they face either the rear of the room or the front of the room, but they all voted to face the windows so that they can look outside. And that, I don't know if it was the swaying of the trees or whatever it was outside going on, it seemed to kind of calm them. So they were less anxious when they were taking the assessment. And that part I really liked because they didn't seem as tense as some other scholars are when they just have to face the walls during testing. Did you notice anything different about the students' behavior, performance, or mood? Um, their mood was, it, it just seemed like they would come in in a rush and frantic and chaotic, but then after a while, they would just kind of calm themselves down. And I mean, it could be attributed to the room. It could be the lighting in here. It could be because everything is a little softer in here. A lot of behavior shifts in the spring. Um, I don't know. it's a hormonal thing or, or what it is, but their behavior seems to shift in the spring, sometimes for the better, sometimes it's just a little different. But I think being in a setting where they are, is kind of like surrounded by say, like a lot, a lack of chaos, a lack of clutter, a lack of just a lot of extraneous stimuli, they kind of calm it down. Good. That's good. Did you notice anything different about your stress level, attention level, behavior, performance. It is calmer in here. So a lot of times I will just turn the classroom lights off, let the natural light in and kind of calm myself, especially if it's a, a class that can be a little more rambunctious than the others. Um, I will sit in a student desk and stare out the window myself <laughs> if I need to. Um, 
I think to me, the the space is really nice. Like I said, I've said a few times that it feels homey. Like I used to live in a wooded area, so it's just kind of like, oh, this is peaceful. Um, I've had other teachers come in here just to calm themselves down. Um, they don't want to eat in here because they don't want to get anything on the carpet. <laughs> But they will come in and say, I actually do feel calmer in this space. Like it's it's really comfortable being in a space like this versus what they're normally used to. Okay. So um, I love those videos, particularly the instructor video. Um, all the things that she said are just um, validating all the things that we're, that we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> so we had one uh, 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 researcher that was in charge of the learning and evaluating the learning. And she developed um, surveys. Uh, these are validated instruments uh, that uh, were given to students. Uh, this was about their sense of their own stress. And uh, there was a pretest and a post-test, post -post meaning before the the uh, experiment began, uh, students were asked about their own stress level and then after, at the end of the school year, uh, they were asked about their stress level. The blue bars are the biophilic classroom, oh, no, I'm sorry, uh, the blue is the pretest, the green is the post-test, and you see the biophilic classroom tests and the control classroom tests. Students' self-perception about their own stress level were significantly less in the biophilic classroom than in the control. Then uh, students at the end of the experiment were asked about their learning in their classroom. And there were three different scales, perception of their physical space, their enjoyment of math lessons, <laughs> their level of involvement in the class. And their, their scores were ranked. And as you can see, the blue bars, the biophilic classroom, you can see that more positive responses were received from the biophilic of students rather than the control students. So at least their own perceptions uh, of the biophilic classroom were quite positive. Now, here comes real quantitative data. Uh, student stress uh, was measured with heart rate variability. How did we do that? First of all, what does that mean? We're not talking about heart rate. We're talking about the variations in heart rate. So as you can see, the upbeat of a standard uh, measurement or a metric of, of a heart rate, the upbeats, uh, we're looking at the variation in those upbeats, okay? And why is that? Um, as it's been explained to me as an architect, um, when I inhale, my heart rate goes up. When I exhale, my heart rate goes down. So if I'm in a relaxed, normal state, there should be a good variation in that heart rate meaning that I get a higher number on my heart rate meter. The higher the number, the more stress reduction that is happening. If I, if I have a, a, a low heart rate variation, I'm bearing down or I'm, a, I'm doing something that affects my, my breathing or my heart rate that makes it standard, that makes it unvaried. And that is a stress condition. This is what it looks like. We had 19 participants in the biophilic classroom and 19 participants in the uh, control classroom. Each of them had their own finger clip-on device from Elite HRV, okay? Little plug for them. Each student also got their own smartphone with an app on it so that when the, the student put their finger in, it sent the signal to the smartphone, which then sent the data up to the cloud. Uh, students were tested. The first minute and the last minute of class three times a week for four months in both classrooms. So we did it at the first minute and the last minute so that we could measure the difference in their stress as a result of their exposure in the learning environment, okay? Some kids are just more geared up, higher strung than others. So we don't just wanna look at raw data. We want to see what the difference is. What was the movement in that stress level as a result of their experience in that learning environment? Okay. Here's what the raw data looked like. Students were blind to researching, 
We didn't have no names. We just knew here's a student, B12. That means student number 12 in the biofield classroom. And this is the data for a month. We looked at their first and second reading on each day. If there wasn't an adequate first and second reading, we threw the data out on that day. And we were looking at the delta, right? See, the, if, you, if you go over to the one, two, three, four, five, sixth column, there's the HRV number. That's what we're looking at. So student B12 on March 4th, their first reading was a 73. At the end of class, his last reading was a 68. That's not good for us. <laughs> that's not proving our point because that's a negative number. We need that number to be higher in order for that student to feel more relaxed after his exposure to the learning environment. But as you can see over a month, the student was typically, you see the 21 there is the summary of the Delta for the month. The student was typically positive, uh, less stressed when he left the learning environment than when he entered. So let's look at uh, the, uh, the uh, population of the data. Uh, okay, this is just average HRV scores. We didn't look at the Delta here. We just looked at average scores first. And again, we did it in February, March, April, and May. And you can see the number of readings, you know, in each class. The gray is the control, the blue is the biophilia. And again, the higher number means my, my average stress is less. So we looked at this data and we said, uh oh, this doesn't work. <laughs> because the students in the control classroom are actually a little less stressed than the students in the biophilia classroom. They've got a higher number. There's more stress reduction, there's less stress. So as it was explained to me that it's really the difference, the delta, because again, some of these kids, I mean, this is a, the sixth grade classroom, they could be coming from a more stressful home environment, we don't know. But we wanna know what's the effect of our, of our design on these students, regardless of what their stress level raw data actually is. So here's the delta. February, March, April, and May, again, the gray is the control, the blue is the biophilic classroom. And this is the average delta in the stress reading for today. So as you can see, we've got a pretty good delta there in February. It's a little bit higher in March. And then look at April. The students in the biophilic classroom in April are profoundly less stressed than the students in the control classroom. We asked the teacher, was there a test in the control? Was there something different? She goes, no, it's all middle school. There's nothing different. I said, well, how do you account for this difference? And she said, spring. Spring happened. It got greener. It got warmer. And students, you heard her, I think you heard her in her interview say, students are a little bit different in the spring. Well, the students in the biophilic classroom had a whole lot more visual connection with spring than the students in the control classroom, right? Shades were up. Then in May, it comes back down to earth a little bit, but uh, we still have a significant, more positive uh, reaction to or stress reduction in the biophilic classroom. Then we looked at it per month. What's that accumulate? Look at, look at how it accumulates over the month. What kind of stress reduction? And, and how, does that, how does that impact the student's performance? Significant stress reduction over the month. So here's the, here's the real red, red meat learning outcomes. So we didn't want to use grades because grades can be attacked in research as being subjective. We, we, we used uh, as our basis of, of analysis, the iReady test scores. This is a diagnostic test that's given to students in September and December and March. And the teachers look at, it's given in math and English, and the teachers look at the gain. How is the cognition gaining, you know, from the teaching that's happening in that class? So we looked at uh, we looked at the gain of cognition uh, in the biophilic classroom and in the control. Now we have a different control for uh, the learning uh, outcomes. Uh, we used the classroom the year before as the control. Same teacher, same course content, same basic classroom, same solo orientation. The only difference is in the biophilic year, 
the colostrum had biophilic enhancements. So this is really locked down. Every single variable is controlled. Uh, the demographic, of course, the students are different, but the demographic of the students is identical. Um, uh, so every variable is controlled. Now let's look at the comparison. The grade bar, now you see September, December, March on the bottom. The average I ready test scores is on the left. The gray is the control the year before. The green is the biophilic year. And we're talking about a much larger uh, sample of students now, about 125 students each year. But look at this, in September, in September, the average test scores were identical. So we can't say that one class is average smarter than the other. They came in with identical test scores in September. Then look at the gain of math cognition in December, right? The biophilic classroom is outperforming. Then look at the gain in March. Biophilic classroom is outperforming. There's gain in both classrooms, in both classes. But look at the average gain over the year in the control, 5.48. The average gain for the biophilic classroom, 18.45. That's more than three times better. That is significant difference in a lockdown, robust scientific study where every variable is controlled, except the biophilic enhancements in the room. That was the only difference. So we've isolated the cause of this gain. Now also the iReady also ranks how the students are, are testing per grade. So in September, 57 out of what, 122, 125 students, uh, 56, 57 were testing at sixth grade level, the fifth or sixth grade level. But in, in March, there's a, nine more students testing at sixth grade level than in the control classroom. So a 7.2% increase there. So let's, we're coming down the home stretch here. Let's just summarize. Um, stress reduction in the biophilic classroom was significantly higher. Improvement in math test scores over a seven month period was more than three times better in the biophilic classroom when compared to their controlled classroom. And you heard the students in the affective domain themselves claim that they, they felt more relaxed, calmer, better able to concentrate from their own words. You heard that they like the atmosphere in the biophilic classroom. So, let me just wrap by saying it's important to consider the impact of the spaces that we design. Um, it's, it's about, it truly, I can't think of any space where it's more important because if I can, if I can impact grades in, in one math class by doing a couple of very small manipulations, inexpensive manipulations to a classroom, then think of the ripple effect that that has on that student's life. Think about if all the classrooms in the school were, were biophilic classrooms or, or all the schools in the district were, were biophilic classrooms. This has a profound impact on the wellness and the academic success of students in these, in these classrooms. It's not the only answer, but it, it, it is an answer of, of how do we improve the performance of students and shouldn't that be at least one criteria of successful learning space architecture? How do the people perform in the spaces that we design? So with that, uh, I'm gonna invite you to look at the, the Q code right there at the bottom. If you uh, uh, take a photo of that Q code, that'll send you right to this study. Uh, and you can download, it sends you to our website. You may have to click to get to the study. But uh, it'll, it'll get you to our study. You can download it. It's for free. There's other uh, outlets. Uh, it's been published by the AIA. Uh, so there's other outlets on the internet. You can get it. Um, but uh, also, there's, uh, there's research tools there that are, you can download. We are surveys for learning and surveys for stress. Happy to share those with you. Uh, maybe you want to use those in your uh, post occupancy evaluation of learning spaces uh, that, that you all do. And then finally, uh, on our last slide here is there the three question survey. You had this QR code in the beginning, but I'll leave it up there because we're interested in, in some of your thoughts too 
uh, about how we can spread the word about biofuel design. So with that, uh, we've, we've got a few minutes left, I think, for um, some Q&A. So if there's anything in the chat box, we're happy to, uh, to uh, respond. Let me go over and take a look. So Anthony, or that's Tony. Tony put that in there, okay. Kimberly wants me to go back one slide. <laughs> there you go. So you can download the study from that. Um, I do want to uh, I do want to say that there's probably uh, this study was published by the AIA back in October of 2019. So uh, it's been on uh, ResearchGate, uh, which is a website for research for about a year. We've got over 1,300 reads all over the world. Um, there's multiple locations on the internet where it's been published, um, and I do think that. Uh, you know, I'm an architect, I'm a practicing architect. That's mostly what I do. But I like having evidence when I tell my clients the design matters. And when they look at me like, well, what do you mean it matters? Um, well, here, this proves that it matters. And this here's, here's exactly how much it matters. Um, hey, this is about change. Jim? Jim? All of us are the change agents. Uh, so please, uh, please, please do use this uh, research uh, with your clients to help make better learning environments. Jim, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, if you can uh, hear me, yeah. I'm gonna flag one, flag question, one question that came that in on the chat, the chat and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna turn, turn it into it two in for, you. for you. Okay. The question on the, the, chat, on the chat was, was, was there any discussion, discussion about, the about the color, color of the different, of the different fits, fits and finishes? And finishes. And I'll add, I'll add in also, add also is there any there discussion, discussion about, about sound, sound and acoustics as far as biophilic design? Right. Well, um, let, me, let me deal with color first. There really is no uh, biophilic, and I, Bill Browning, I've heard Bill Browning say this many times, there's really no biophilic studies that have really analyzed color. Uh, mostly what we were doing was, was interested in the pattern. Uh, so we had to be kind of neutral with the colors we were choosing. Um, I will say this, there is some uh, suggestion in the biophilic research that I've done that red is a no-no. When you see red in nature, um, it's meant to ward you off. It's meant to be a warning. Uh, but there really is no significant study that, that says one color over another uh, you know, is, is, a, is a biophilic device. I think there's other research uh, that talks about impacts of color but not biophilic research. And uh, as far as sound, there certainly is a lot of uh, research about sound and, and noises and a bird song, for example, uh, is, has been found to be stress reducing. Uh, there are certainly sounds of nature that uh, do have impact. And I think there's some, there's a, some good research about that. Uh, but as far as acoustics, I'm not aware of anything in the biophilic realm about acoustics. Um, I would say that the carpet that we put into the biophilic classroom, we were concerned about the acoustic difference in the control, which is why we put carpet in there as well. Um, so um, that answers about the color and uh, not much about color, a lot about sound, uh, but definitely go to, I would encourage you to look at 14 patterns of uh, biophilic design to get you know, a deeper dive into all of this. And, and Jim, there's uh, one other question came in. How does biophilic design impact the cost of a project, particularly when COVID is impacting local and state economies? Right. Yeah, I sort of get this question a lot. Um, whenever you present something new, um, people just assume it's gonna be more expensive. Uh, if I'm not putting in uh, opaque mini blinds, in a learning space and I'm putting in Meco shades instead, I don't really feel there's a significant cost difference there. Now to motorize that, uh, there's a significant cost difference there, but you don't have to do that. It's really about the quality of light and the graphic pattern that's coming into the space. So um, 
you know, planting a garden outside a classroom is pretty inexpensive. Now, the, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get uh, school districts to come back and say, oh, but the maintenance of that. Well, you can get, you can get uh, uh, landscape material that's pretty low maintenance. So uh, there's definitely, uh, you know, there's definitely a way to weave through this to say that you can incorporate biophilic design for literally no financial difference in the cost of your school. Now, you can go the other way, and certainly you can in increase it. Uh, we tried to pick things that we thought were pretty minimal cost uh, expenditures to make it more accessible to people. And I'd like to throw in one here from an operator's perspective. Um, you know, that was a 1925 building that went through a multi-million dollar renovation. And some folks we had presented to before got kind of got that mixed in with the biophilic upfit costs. And that wasn't the case because the control room had the same renovation that the biophilic classroom had. And then we went one step further, uh, or the study did, um, I would say, based on the numbers that I've heard for everybody out there, that you know, retrofitting in a biophilic standard as a retrofit is probably one to two percent of a typical uh, renovation cost. If you do it while you're renovating, that percentage could drop even below one percent. So that's just me looking at how most of this is fit and finish work, um, as well as some of the differences in landscaping. I also want to say too that, you know, um, it's, it's, we all have to live in the real world and cost is certainly a concern uh, in order to, to get the thing done. But at the same time, I think that we need to challenge, how do you measure success to our clients? If you look at the mission and the goal and the vision of any uh, school district, you're gonna see student achievement, uh, sustainability, student wellness, social emotional health. Um, we have to live in a, in a world where we've got to deal with budgets, just like we've got to deal with building codes and a variety of, of stakeholder concerns. But to really achieve the goals and the mission of that school district, we can give you classrooms where students have better wellness, are healthier, can achieve better. And isn't that right square in the center of where they are already defining success. So yes, we've got to deal with cost. Don't let that be the goal. The goal is achieving the success as your school district defines it. So there's a little bit of framing the argument there that I think you can play. Jim, we got one last question that came in. I'll read it to you. If you'll advance the slide one more time so they can look at that survey QR code as we go out, because we're about out of time. Um, the question is, hey, could you expand on your answer for color? Are there groups of color that are better than others or that should be stayed away from like harsh colors? And I know we get into the, the primary colors, descriptions and things, red, dark, whatever. Are there yeah. any things to watch out for on that? Yeah, again, I'm gonna, I'm not trying to evade, but as a, I've learned, I'm not a researcher, I'm an architect, but I've learned from researchers that if you're gonna say something, you better have a source to back it up with. And again, there's no research that really backs this up. But my own, my own uh, practice, I look out and what do I see in nature that makes me feel good? And I use that. Um, if you don't see it in nature, um, I would steer clear of it. But again, there's no scientific robust study that really says from a biophilic design standpoint, this is better than that. But that's the best answer I got. <laughs> How's that? Well, listen, uh, I think we're out of time. Um, thanks to A4LE for giving us the opportunity. Thank you all for your time. And uh, we, we appreciate uh, your attention. Please, uh, please download the research and uh, please be a change agent. Okay, thank you guys very much.